Good evening and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We will be in the 18th chapter of John tonight. This is the trial of Jesus, basically. And um, we get to see the hypocrisy. We get to see how people fall into becoming the pawns, actually. They think they're in control and really they're under control. So let's just pray and get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson tonight. Thank you, Lord, that you willingly allowed this to happen to you for my sake, for our sake. Father, you were not a, you did not send Jesus to be a victim. You sent him to be a victor. And so we praise you for that. So as we study this, help us to realize that it was all in your plan all along and that the people that thought they were winning, that thought they were putting down Jesus' ministry, were really just playing their role in your plan. And because of it all, we have his gospel today. So we thank you for that. Help us to be spreaders of your gospel. Help us to be true to your word. We praise you and we thank you and we ask you for your forgiveness where we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight in uh, chapter 18, a little bit between last week's lesson and this week's lesson, um, we, we see that Jesus had been bound. He had been uh, taken away, possibly 200 soldiers or more, plus some of the, the religious officials. Why they bound Jesus, he had never been violent. We don't really know, but quite a spectacle to come to get one man. So anyway, they take him to Annas, and Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, or Caiaphas, I'm not sure how that's actually pronounced, who was the high priest at that time, and he tells them to take him on to, to Caiaphas. So they do. If you remember a few weeks ago, this Caiaphas is the one who said, better that one man die for all the people, and I said that was very prophetic. He didn't know it, but that it was very prophetic because Jesus not only was just going to die for the people, the Jews that he was referring to, but he was dying for all mankind. Two, according to John's account, two disciples followed him and went to the, the courts where he was going to be taken to Caiaphas. Um, that was probably John and Peter. We know for sure it was Peter. Uh, but anyway, eventually Peter gets inside the courtyard, and that is where he denies Jesus three times. And then Caiaphas questions Jesus. He questions Jesus about his disciples, questions him about his teaching, and Jesus' answer to him was, I've been teaching openly everywhere. I haven't done anything in secret, and so if you want to know about my teaching, you can ask anyone that's heard me. And so as a result, of course, Caiaphas was just outraged, and his goal, along with the other religious leaders, is to get Jesus crucified, to get him dead and out of the way so that this movement stops and that they are no longer threatened by this movement. And so by this time, it's the early morning hours, and he is, he, Caiaphas is ready to turn this over to someone else. As we find often, People that are wicked and have wicked schemes usually try to find someone else to carry out their dirty work. And that's exactly what he was doing. He was going to send him on now to Pilate. And so that's where our lesson picks up in verse 28 of chapter 18. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid, cer to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So they have now moved him. So this large entourage in the very early morning hours in the streets of Jerusalem, going from the area where they had been with Caiaphas going to now to the palace where Pilate lived. And so they had, while Jesus was there, they had 
physically abused him. We know that that John's account says that they slapped him and that they spit on him. And, and some of the other accounts said that he was slapped, that he was spit on, that he was uh, hit with fists, that they brought in false witnesses, and that this went on pretty much all night, and then finally accused him of blasphemy and took him to Pilate. So that's where we are now on this journey through the streets of Jerusalem to go see Pilate. So it's probably quite a sight going through through the streets with this crowd of soldiers and the officials. And then notice it says, when they arrived, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. They didn't want to become unclean by entering into the residence of a Gentile. Now, it was quite okay to cause an innocent man to be condemned to death. <laughs> they weren't dirty. They weren't unclean because of that, but they would be unclean to walk into the house of a Gentile. And so here they are demanding the death of an innocent man, and they know he's innocent. They're demanding the death of an innocent man, but they won't go into a Gentile's house so that they won't be unclean so that they can take the Passover. Remember, the Passover was this week-long ordeal, and then on the eighth day, they had this, um, this feast of unleavened bread. And so they didn't want to do anything that would make them not able to participate in any of that. And then in verses 29 and 30, So Pilate came out to them, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. So probably the guards or whoever that guarded the the gates of the palace told Pilate what was going on, that this large entourage had this man from the Jewish leaders and that they brought him for him to judge. And so, and that they can't come in because it's Passover. And so Pilate does go out to them to see what's going on. And so the first thing he asks them is, what charges are you bringing against him? What are you bringing against him? What do I need to judge him for? And it was it was common for uh, this Roman governor to to judge these things and to, but he he quite possibly I mean you know good and well that he was expecting some serious charges. Instead, they didn't even answer his question in John's account. Now in some accounts in uh, Matthew and Luke and some of the other accounts they talked about. Uh, him not wanting to pay taxes, uh, just some different things like that. But um, but in John's account, they don't even mention those things. They just say, if, we, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him here to you. So they didn't even officially answer the question. And we have to understand the relationship between the Jews and 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 the the Romans the Jews were just a pain in the neck for the Romans they were always having their religious squabbles there were the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and I mean the Pharisees and the Sadducees who both made up this council of the Sanhedrin and they couldn't get along and then they were always trying to impose these things and laws and on the people and so there was always some kind of conflict going on but now that Jesus has entered the scene and Jesus has followers, and, and the Jews are stirred up constantly. And so they are a nuisance. They're a nuisance to people like Pilate. Pilate's main job, his primary purpose, being put as a governor over this area, and there were governors all over the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire covered most of the known earth at that time. The, the known world at that time, the Roman Empire covered most of it. There was an Eastern Roman Empire and a Western Roman Empire, two sections of the Roman Empire. It was huge, most of the known world. And so they had these regional governors, and those governors were to keep their region from causing trouble, to keep peace and solitude in those regions. And if they didn't, then they had to answer to Rome. And they didn't want to answer to Rome. And so Pilate has had this stirring. I mean, look at what happened when Jesus came into Jerusalem and the triumphant entry, entry where the people were singing praises to him and doing all this. And so he's very torn. He doesn't really know, I think, what to do for sure. What, what would be the right thing to do? 
over this. So he says, what charges are you bringing against this man? You know he had heard of Jesus already. And they said, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. So we go now to verses, um, verses 30 and 31. And another thing too is the Romans could have cared less about their religious laws. As long as they weren't causing trouble, uprisings, they could care less. They could do whatever they wanted to about their religious laws, as long as they weren't causing any kind of trouble. But the main thing that Rome cared about was, were you doing anything that threatened the Roman Empire? So their idea, the the Jews' idea of being a criminal was that he had broken their religious laws. The Romans' idea of a criminal was someone who was a threat to the Roman Empire. And so very different ways of reasoning and, and thoughts of criminality here. And so in verses 31 and 32, Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law, but we have no right to execute anyone they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Jesus didn't want... Um, excuse me, the Jews didn't want just any punishment. They didn't want anything that they could do. They wanted execution. They wanted Jesus dead. They felt like if they had Jesus dead, he was the threat. If they had Jesus dead, this movement would die, and then they could have their little world back. They wouldn't be challenged. They wouldn't be threatened. What they didn't realize is that the way they were acting, the demands that they were making, they were actually pawns in God's plan that had been laid since the foundation of the world. So in verse 33, <clears throat> excuse me, Pilate went back inside the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? It wasn't uncommon for a Roman to, like a Roman official like Pilate, to actually judge a non-Roman. That was not uncommon, but he would have expected some kind of real charges brought against this man. There was, he, he had the power to set him free. He had the power to have him executed. And his word was the law. There was no due process. There was no appeal system. His word was the law. He represented Caesar in that area. And so he, he's asking, he, when he goes back inside, are you the king of the Jews? Because if he was a king, then that would be treasonous because it would be threatening the Roman Caesar, the Roman um, law, the Roman rule, you might say. And so he specifically asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? You know, he, you claim to be the Messiah. Some of them talk about that. And, of course, the Jews had talked about him being Messiah, which was in their interpretation— someone to come and to overturn the Romans, which was not the true destiny and the true mission of the of Messiah. Messiah was to come to establish his kingdom, and it was a kingdom in the hearts of man, not a military kingdom. But anyway, so Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And here, the, and it just begins this conversation between Pilate and Jesus. And so the conversation, Jesus now, in reply, asks Pilate a question. And he says, in verse 34 through 36, is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? And Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. So Jesus answers Pilate with a question. Is that your own idea or did someone else did someone else put that idea in your head? Jesus is still very calm and he's still very in control. And then Pilate kind of rears up and he says, well, am I a Jew? You know, your own people brought you to me. Your chief, your chief priests and, and your officials brought you to me. What is it that you've done? And Jesus replies, my kingdom is not of this world. 
I'm not a king of anything in this world. He came to be kings in our hearts. He came to establish his eternal kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. And if it was, then my servants would be here protecting me. They'd be fighting for me. They would have tried to prevent me from being arrested by these Jewish officials. My kingdom's from another place. Jesus' focus was way bigger than an earthly kingdom. Of course, Pilate won't, does not understand that. The Jews do not even understand that. It was evident to Pilate that this was not an earthly king. I mean, here this man stood. He had been slapped and hit and, and sped upon and, and all of these things. It was evident to Pilate that he was not an earthly king. And then in verses 37 and 38, the conversation continues. Are you a king then, said Pilate? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. So Pilate again understands what a kingdom is. I mean, he serves Caesar. He knows what this vast empire that he serves under is, but he does not understand a kingdom not of this world. So again, he asks, so are you a king then? Let me get this straight, because if you are a king, maybe you pose a threat to Caesar, but you don't look like a king to me. And so Jesus responds and he says, you say I'm a king but I was really born to testify to the truth. And people who are interested in the truth will listen to me. So Jesus is trying to establish what he's really all about. And basically he says, you're the one that's saying I'm a king, not me. You're the one that said it. So I was born to testify to the truth. We know as believers that God's word is truth. We know that God's conviction is truth. We know that Jesus's mission was to buy our ransom, to establish our salvation, and the truth that sin causes us to need that salvation, the truth that testifies to God and testifies to Jesus and testifies to our need for Jesus. So Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. And so he is saying, I just came to testify to the truth. And so Pilate says, well, what is the truth? Not like he really wanted to know what Jesus' truth was. But even this pagan ruler knew that whatever it was that they had stirred up and conjured up to bring against Jesus, that this was not an earthly king standing before him. And we know that Jesus had to be crucified and that what he was being tried for wasn't what he had done. What he was being tried for was what we had done. What mankind had done from the beginning of time and what mankind will do until the end of time. That's what Jesus was really on trial for that day. And only a sinless savior could die in our place. And then in verse 38, the second part of verse 38, with this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. So like I said, this pagan ruler knew that punishing Jesus was wrong. Now he is going to succumb he will become a pawn also. His weakness, he will become a pawn in this plan that it was established from the foundation of time. He will also. But he says, I find no charge that, that, we, that this man should be even charged, much less executed. How can we convict him of something that I don't even find a charge for? And so John skips quite a bit at this point, and he skips right to Pilate allowing the Jews to choose Barabbas over Jesus. But if we look in other Gospels, we see that 
Pilate's wife warned him not to get involved with this innocent man, Jesus. We see that Pilate washes his hands and says, I'm, not re I'm putting the responsibility back on you. I find no fault with this man and I'm washing my hands of it and his blood is on you. John mentions neither one of those things. And Luke tells us <clears throat> that Pilate also, that Pilate heard that, that Jesus was from Galilee and he said, oh, good. <laughs> and he's not under my jurisdiction. Let's send him to Herod. Herod's over the area of Galilee. And so he actually sent him to Herod and then Herod sends him back to Pilate. So Pilate succumbs to the Jewish leaders. And verse 39 and 40, it says, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. So I think Pilate thought maybe he had found a loophole. I think he thought, yeah, maybe, maybe they'll take this man because I, I really don't think Pilate was, not that he cared about Jesus, but I, he wasn't convinced that these, this nuisance of the Jewish leaders should get their way with Jesus, that he had done, he could find nothing that he had done that was, that was justifiable for punishment. And so Pilate tries to find a loophole probably not sure really which way he should go. I mean, stop and think about this. Here are these religious leaders that are insisting that this man be executed. And they don't have the authority to execute him. They, they, that's one of the things they actually said back over here in, in part of the scripture. We don't have the authority to execute him, but you do. And so Pilate is saying, hey, this man does not need to be executed. So he's, he's trying to find this loophole, but I think Pilate feels caught. He knows that there could be uprisings because the people just laid their cloaks and palm leaves. And you know he heard about that in the streets a few days ago as Jesus entered Jerusalem. He knows he has many followers, and yet he knows the power of these Jewish leaders among the Jewish people. So he's kind of in that rock and a hard place thing. He's kind of a no-win situation. And so he says, okay, here's the deal, guys. You know at Passover every year, I release someone who's in prison to you. And so do you want me to release Jesus this year? And we'll just be done with this whole situation. And they shout, no, no, give us Barabbas. Barabbas had been in an uprising, and some accounts actually call him a uh, murderous, and uh, I forgot, rebel, or so, I forgot what they call him, but apparently he was, he was pretty violent. He deserved being in prison. He had been in an uprising against the Roman government, which was certainly, you know, punishable by death. It was a capital crime, and yet these people are crying out, no, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas, turn him loose. We would rather you turn him loose than Jesus. So to draw this lesson to a close, there are a, I want to go a couple of different directions. The first thing I want to say is, it is so easy, this is to apply it to us, it is so easy for us to see the hypocrisy in others. We see the hypocrisy in the Jews. And yet, we're often blind to our own hypocrisy. They were blind to their own hypocrisy. They would not go into the house of a Gentile, and yet they were doing, pulling every string, doing everything they could do to get this innocent man killed so that they wouldn't be unclean and they could participate in the Passover. We can see that hypocrisy, and yet often we're blind to our own hypocrisy. It should be our prayer that Jesus would help us to see ourselves as he sees us. And then the Jews think they're winning. They think they're winning. They think that they are getting Jesus trapped and that he is going to get crucified and that they have won and that this this following of Jesus will just melt away. Little did they know 
that they were just part of the plan. They were just part of the plan. And we need to remember throughout this story, I think we have the tendency to think of Jesus as a victim, but Jesus was not a victim. Jesus was on his way to victory.